Want to see what the Fox Alien Vasto is capable of? Then keep watching. Hey everyone and welcome to another episode of James Dean Designs. If you love CNC videos, make sure you hit that subscribe button in the corner to get all the latest updates. In today's episode, we're going to be reviewing the Fox Alien Vasto CNC machine. This is their latest model to the market and came out at the end of last year, 2021. Now I initially did a build video for this machine, link is up in the corner. Typically, I always do a build and review video together. However, given that this is the most expensive machine I've ever had in my workshop, but more importantly, the highest specification machine I've ever had in my workshop. I thought it was only right to do some extra tests and go into extra detail on this machine to really see what it's capable of and how accurate it can be. Now, just to be clear, we are testing this machine straight out of the box. Now, modifications, upgrades, or tweaks have been made. So essentially, what you're going to see in this video today is exactly what you get when you receive it and it arrives. So let's dive straight in and start talking about the specifications. So I'm going to start off by saying all the measurements that I'm using in this video based on what I've physically taken from this machine, not what is listed on the Fox Alien website. There are some discrepancies. So if you're watching this and thinking that's not what Fox Alien are advertising, it's because I'm taking it off what is physically in front of me. Now, let's start with the footprint of this machine itself. Well, end plate to the end of the step motor here, we have 780 millimeters wide. From the bolts on the front to the step motors at the back, we have 820 millimeters deep. So 780 by 820 is based, the base that you will need for this. That also includes the drag chains as well because there's no overhang from them. The height you'll need to allow for is just shy of half a meter. So from your work surface to the top of this Z stepper motor, 470 millimeters. Now this is a fixed height by the way, the front of the Z goes up and down, not the stepper motor itself. Now that base doesn't account for the control box on the side. This is about 250 millimeters wide, but you do have a meter's worth of cable with it so it can go on the right, on the left, on the front, on the back. You've got a bit of flexibility with it. Now onto the work area itself. The official listing for this is 400 by 400, but I, when I actually measured it, I got more out of it. So on the X axis, we got 420. On the Y axis, we got 430. Now you probably can get a bit more out of it by tweaking the positions of the limit switches if you wanted to, but we're working with what comes out of the box as it is. So 420 by 430 on your work area. On the Z height, now officially this is listed at 100 millimeters. I measured this at 105 millimeters. But what I should point out is the clearance from the gantry to the work air, to your work bed is only just over 80 millimeters. It's about 81, 82. What that realistically means is the thickest piece of material you can get onto your bed with the gantry to travel over it is about 80 millimeters. Now, when you allow for Z um, safety height travel, that does come to close to 100 millimeters. So it probably is about right, but just bear that in mind. I've never machined anything 80 millimeters deep anyway, but I am just pointing that out. Now onto the hardware of the machine itself. Well, all of the axes are held in place with linear rails. These are HG15 linear rails. Basically what that means is they are 15 millimeters deep solid pieces of metal with the linear rail systems going along them. Now they are dual linear rails on each axis as well and this all just starts building to how solid this machine is. The linear rails minimize the amount of player movement you're going to get in each axis. Now the axes are driven by ball screws. You have 16 millimeter ball screws on the X and Y. You have a 12 millimeter ball screw on the Z axis. Now, if you're not familiar with a ball screw, um, basically what it is, it's a different mechanism for driving the axis about. On typical desktop CNC machines, you have an Acme screw. And basically what that is, it's a bit like a nut and a bolt system. They basically, they grind against each other. It's metal rubbing on metal. And even with lubricant over time, you'll get a bit of play because of the friction and the metal wearing away. Now with a ball screw, it's a slightly different mechanism. You've got lots of small ball bearings almost encased in a facility that allow it to run much smoother, less friction. So an Acme setup is high friction. This is a low friction system. Basically means that you're gonna get 
less play and less movement over time. So it's just a much smoother drive system for a solid machine like this. Now these are all driven with NEMAT 23 stepper motors. So you've got a decent amount of power coming from those. And in the control box itself are DM542 drivers in case you're interested in the spec of that. Now coming back to limit switches, you have dual limit switches on every axis. So that basically is just a safety feature on either side of the axis, no matter which you're running to stop the machine from going too far and causing too much damage. On the front of the machine, we have a 400 watt air cooled spindle. I'm gonna come back to this in a second, but you can also fit a laser with this. The back of the control box will take a laser input and the back of the box will also take an offline controller. Now, Fox Alien do openly say the standard offline controllers they're selling at the moment do not work with this machine. If you want one, you will need to contact them. But I dare say it's just shipping issues and probably by the time this video goes out, everything may have caught up and they may have an official offline controller available for this. Now, coming back to the spindle itself. When Fox Alien first advertised this machine, I thought linear rails, great, huge upgrade ball screws even better, just making this machine really solid. And then I saw that it came with a 400 watt spindle and I was a bit like, it's a bit underpowered for the strength of this machine. But the more I thought about it, I actually started to realize why. Now a 400 watt spindle is, it's nothing to sneer at. There's a fair amount of power in there. There's about half the power of a Dewalt router. But the reason they've fitted this, as opposed to giving you something else, is basically to give you the choice yourself. So. One person over here wants a Makita router, another person over here wants a Dewalt, somebody else may want a water cooled spindle. There are lots of choices available. And if they put something in here that didn't necessarily please everyone, well, you would basically be paying for that upgrade that you didn't want. So if you were a Dewalt person and they fitted a Makita router, you'd be paying for a Makita router when you knew straight away you were going to change it. So by supplying a 400 watt spindle, gives you the choice to then fit whatever you want to the machine if you decide to make it more powerful. And they also provide you with the 65 millimeter and 69 millimeter diameter holders, which are the most common sizes for the standard um, routers and spindles out there. So it's not gonna cost you anything else to buy another bracket for this. They've already covered that off. Now, in saying all that, what it's basically rounding up to is this is a very solid machine. So let's move on, put it through its paces and see what it can do. So straight away, that is some pretty impressive hardware for a desktop CNC machine. Now, just to be clear, Fox Alien even say on their own website that to get the most out of this hardware, you really should upgrade that 400 watt spindle to something more powerful. However, for the purpose of this review, as I said at the start of the video, we are going to stick with what you get out of the box. So let's move on, do some backlash testing and see what kind of accuracy we can expect from this machine. So we're about to do a backlash test. Now, if you're not familiar with what backlash is, it's essentially the amount of play or movement you have in the axis. And this applies to all three axes. So when it travels in one direction and then traverses and comes back the other way, it's the amount of play before it picks the um, carriage back up to send it back. Now, in machines like 3018, you can physically shake the carriage and see how much play is in there. But obviously in higher quality machines, you expect a lot less. And that's exactly what we're going to test now. So we've got the dial indicator set up. This is clamped down to the spoil board and it's just sitting on the edge there. So I can pull that back in and out and we can see it's reset to zero. Now we're gonna bring this in at 10 millimeters, then send it back out 10 millimeters. And we should see a slight difference here. Obviously, hopefully we're hoping for zero, but there may be a little bit of backlash in there. Now this measures at one hundredth of a millimeter. So 10 hundreds, 20 hundreds and so on. So let's run this test and see what the difference is. I should clarify, this is just a cheap dial off Amazon. It's not calibrated, but it's more to give an indication of whether there is backlash. So let's do the test. Let's bring it in by 10 millimeters. Now we can see that's just come up short of the zero. So we're about two or three hundredths of a millimeter off, which is actually nothing at all. This could be due to the steps needing to be calibrated on the axis, but let's send it back and see what the backlash difference is. That is back to zero, that is perfect, and exactly what we would expect of a machine of this caliber. So let's carry this test out now on the Y axis and the Z axis as well. Let's do this on the Y. Back to zero, perfect. 
So a slightly awkward angle, but reset back to zero. Let's take it down by 10 millimeters and back up. And there we have it, zero again, perfect. So just to put that into context, let's perform the same test on the 4040 XE. We'll bring it in 10 millimeters and back out 10 millimeters. We can see there we have a discrepancy of about eight or nine hundredths of a millimeter. Now we are talking hundreds of a millimeter here, so it's still not a huge amount, but it is one of the differences that we're looking at between a thousand dollar machine and a two and a half thousand dollar machine. So one thing I've noticed as I've been working on this is there is some deflection in the bed. Now these are aluminium lengths with MDF on top, but they do span a long gap. There is nothing joining them up together and there is no support underneath horizontally either. So while we've got the dial indicator out, we're going to do a quick test. I'm just gonna drop a weight on that is just under five kilograms. Now this is just sitting on one beam itself, but what we can see is there about three tenths of a millimeter deflection. Now chances are you're never gonna put anything this heavy, specifically not this heavy on one beam either. So it's probably slightly exaggerated, but it just goes to show that there is some deflection in the bed itself and a bit of reinforcement underneath may be needed. Sticking with the bed for the time being, it's great that Fox Alien have moved forward and are using a combination of aluminium and the MDF. So this gives you the track system to allow for all your clamps to work, but it also gives you some MDF to allow possibly to use as a spoil board and also surface to make sure it's flat. What I should say is you only have about two and a half millimeters worth of um, MDF sticking above the aluminium. So what that means in reality is you can probably surface it once, maybe even twice, but after that you may need to replace the MDF with something thicker if you do regularly cut through material on your CNC machines. So I have to be honest, I was expecting backlash from this machine, maybe only a tiny bit, but those results were brilliant. So let's move on and start to do some tests in some wood. So this test is fairly basic. We've got an 18 mil ply fitted to the bed already. We've got a 1 8 upcut flat end mill in the collet. And we're gonna do a repeat series of cuts one after another at different depths. So the cut that we're doing is a square with a cross and a circle in, in the middle of it. Now the reason for this is when you cut a square, it only ever tests one axis at each time at a constant velocity. When you do a cross, especially a 45 degree cross, it runs both axes together at the same velocity velocity to get from point A to point B. When you do a circle, it runs both axes together, but at variable velocities, because as it goes around the arc, each axis has to slow down and speed up accordingly to create that shape. So essentially, we're gonna be putting all the axes through a bit of a test here by doing these multiple shapes. Now we're gonna start off at a thousand millimeters per minute at one millimeter depth of cut. The speed will stay the same, but on the next one, it will go down to 1.5 millimeters, then to two millimeters, then to 2.5 millimeters, and so on, up until about six and a half millimeters depth of cut. Now, one of three things is going to happen. Either it's going to complete all the cuts and it's gonna get down to six and a half millimeters deep at a thousand millimeters per minute. If it does, I'll be really impressed and it will really show the power of this setup. Alternatively, the two things that will happen after that is either the, the bit is going to break or I'm gonna lose my nerve, hit emergency stop because I think everything is struggling anyway. So let's get this underway and see how well it performs. So my nerves held out and we cut the entire grid. Now I've just vacuumed this, I haven't bothered to sand it because at the end of the day, we're using an upcut bit in plywood so we were going to get rough results. But the great news is it cut the last square which is six and a half millimeters deep at a thousand millimeters per minute. Now it actually came out at 6.7 millimeters deep which either means there's a slight taper in the spoil board or the steps on the z-axis needed just in. Either way, minor things we can overcome at a later time. Now the other good thing about this test is it would have highlighted if any steps were missed. So as we were going to the deeper squares, they started to get a little bit of chatter in the spindle. That's normally when you end up having missed steps and these squares would have been out of alignment with the layer below. All the circles would have been distorted, but everything is in alignment. The circles are perfect circles. So actually this test has come out really well and it's proven how capable this machine actually is. So I moved on and did this six inch 3D relief carving of a fox. This has been done on pine and with an oak stain applied to it to make some of the detail areas pop out a bit more. Now I just guessed the feeds and speeds for this. Combine this with the fact it's pine as well. There are some fuzzy areas going on which probably could have been dialed in and cleaned up a little bit more. 
All I did at the end of this job was run a brush sander over it to get rid of as much fuzziness as possible. But overall, it's actually come out really well. There is a lot of detail and definition going on and to achieve that we did this with a 0.5 tapered ball nose bit with a step over of 10%. So that basically means every line it's moving up is about 500 of a millimetre. Now this took about two hours to complete the detail pass but as we can see it is well worth it because we have got a lot of definition and detail going on in some of these areas. So six and a half millimeters deep at a thousand millimeters per minute. That's pretty impressive, but let's be honest, we probably always knew we were going to get some decent results using wood on this machine. So let's move forward and do something a bit more challenging. Let's have a play with some aluminium. This is a scrap piece of aluminium left over from when I reviewed the 3020 Pro Max. We've installed a 1.8 single flute bit, also known as an O flute bit. You can get these from Speedtool. Check out the links in the description if you want to get 16% off them as well. I've also installed this air hose. You can use these to spray mist as well, but for the purpose of today, it's just going to blow air to clear the debris out the way and also try and keep the tip cool. Now, I don't work with aluminium much, so this is a bit of an experiment for me. We're just gonna do some simple holes at different speeds and see where we get to and what this machine can do. So I've machined multiple holes. We did this at passes of 0.3 millimeters depth of cut at a speed of 800, 1000, 1200, 1400, 1600 and 1800. It was cutting absolutely fine. One thing I will need to do is ramp the moves in as it cuts down to save it being such a, a judder on the impact. So let's carry on and cut out something a bit more useful. So with a bit of a clean up and polish, we certainly have something a lot more useful. We've now got ourselves a bottle opener. Now this cut out pretty well, and I should say doing profile cuts like this are one of the most difficult types of cut to do, especially when it starts to go deep. And this is also pretty hard aluminium, so it has come out really well. It's not perfect. There are some tooling marks on the back there. I don't know if we can just get that on camera. Now the reason for this is when it was slowing down to cut the tabs that we can see here that were holding it in place, it's obviously had a little bit of deflection and that started to cause those tooling marks. Now the downside to this is once you start to get those marks, it gets worse every pass. So as I say, it's not unsurprising, but we were only using a 1 8 end mill, so that was pretty thin and probably has quite a bit of deflection in it. But overall, pretty good result. So let's move on and machine something else in aluminium. And just to prove that even I make mistakes, things didn't go right the first time, nor the second time. So this is straight off the bed. All I've simply done is brushed off some of the swarf and give it a wipe over. Considering that I don't machine metal, this has come out really well. The finish on it's really nice. I might even run the polisher over to see if we can get it shinier than it's come out already. But for a 400 watt spindle, that has come out really nice. So let's take a closer look, but I'm gonna begin by saying the detail pass for this should have originally been a 0.5 tapered ball nose bit, but it snapped within the first couple of passes. So I then had to change it to a 1 8 ball nose bit, just a standard straight one. So that the reason I'm telling you this, is it may account for some of the discrepancies I'm about to point out shortly. Now on the whole, the finish of this has come out great. It's nice and smooth, there's definition in the pattern in the middle. Yes, you can see a few lines, but this is aluminium and they can all probably be polished out fairly easy. Around some of the edges, we can see a bit of a texture that almost looks like a welding pattern. Obviously, this is a result of the curvature of the ball nose and the step over that we have going on with this. Now, I'm not sure if the camera can see this top right hand corner. If I bring in a torch and just move it back and forwards, hopefully you can start to see those steps in the metal. Now, the reason I just wanted to point out at the start about the changing the bits over is because it means the roughing pass may not have aligned the same way as it should have done when I changed the bit over. But what we can start to see is a slightly stepped texture in this top area. And it also happens a little bit on this bottom area as well. Now, this top and the bottom is basically where the bit is under most pressure from lateral load moving backwards and forth. So I think we've had a bit of deflection going on with the bit, which is understandable. It was a fairly thin bit machine in aluminium. But overall, the texture of this has come out nice. There's definitely good definition. It's come out really smooth. So after doing all those tests, well, what is the conclusion? Let's start with the negatives. Actually, to be more specific, negative, singular. So that is the bed. 
We saw earlier on, once we put a bit of weight on it, we started to get some deflection and that will have a negative impact on the things that you are machining, especially the closer to the center of the bed that they are. The good news is the solution to it is fairly simple. You can either just put a piece of wood underneath to give it that extra support. You can put a couple of pieces of aluminium extrusion underneath as well. Again, it will just take that deflection out of it. And we were only talking about three tenths of a millimeter, but you know, just something to bear in mind, you may want to put an extra piece of support under your machine when you get it. The other thing with the bed as well, is that two and a half millimeters sticking above the aluminium with the MDF. So that probably only applies if you are doing lots of cut throughs to your material, because at some point you will need to resurface the bed if you don't do it straight away when you receive the machine anyway. So again, solutions to it are fairly simple. You can either put your own spoil board on top completely, and then obviously you've got a fresh spoil board to work with, or replace the piece of existing MDF with something thicker. So you've got um, multiple times that you can surface the spoil board without getting too close to that aluminium. So, you know, not difficult things to resolve, but something slightly niggly that you probably will need to address at some time when purchasing this machine. So moving on from the negatives to the positives, what are they? Well, pretty much everything else about this machine, if I'm honest. The Fox Alien have clearly spent a lot of time looking at our competitors, looking at other machines on the market, what works well, what doesn't work as well. They've put so much thought process into this that it's clearly not a machine that's been rushed to market. A lot of time has been taken. Not only with the hardware selection, but other little things on top, like the extrusion covers, for example. They stop the dust getting in there. They protect the wiring, give it a smoother visual appearance all round. It's those little things that really start to stack up on top of each other. You then include the fact of the extra power, the accuracy of this machine and lack of backlash. It just goes to just how great of a machine this actually is and as I say how much thought has gone into the build process of it. The 400 watt spindle straight out of the box we've already seen you can get some great results with this. Now imagine spending a bit more time and dialing that in you're going to get some amazing results just from the 400 watt spindle. Now that's not to say you shouldn't upgrade it. You have a lot of hardware here that is more than capable of taking an upgraded spindle. So you definitely should factor that in about upgrading the spindle. But what I'm trying to say is it doesn't need to be upgraded straight away. You can get the machine, have a play about with it, then decide what you're going to upgrade to at a later time. Am I going to be upgrading mine? Well, I've already brought this one and a half kilowatt brushless spindle. Now that is going to cut through aluminium like butter when we drop that in in a future episode. So do keep an eye out for that. It's definitely something to consider over some over a Makita or a Dewalt router. Those are probably much better, uh, say, than the routers like we've installed previously. Now. I guess what I'm building up to say is how brilliant of a machine this is and how lucky I am to actually have it in my workshop. The, the results we're going to get out of this are amazing, I say, with the, the accuracy, the power, and especially once we drop that spindle into it. So if you are thinking of buying one of these, then please consider the affiliate links in the description area below. They don't cost you any more. I may just get a tiny bit back from Fox Alien, which ultimately goes to being able to make these videos and keeping the channel going. So if you do have any comments and questions, obviously, let me know in the comments section down below. I'll do my best to answer them all. And well, final thanks always goes to my patrons i will see you on the next episode and keep an eye out for when we install that that uh, spindle it's going to be a game changer